I present to you the no-win scenario, most often in the form of the Kobayashi Maru test, which is a Starfleet Academy Starship Command simulation for those officers who are on the command career path. It was first introduced to us in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, and from that great movie, we know that Kirk cheated on the test. Rather than receive a reprimand, he was commended for original thinking, as there is no way to win this test no matter what you do. This is a test of character. In the novel, The Kobayashi Maru by Julia Eklar, it is revealed how several members of the Enterprise's command crew dealt with the test. This included Chekhov, Sulu, Scotty, and of course Kirk. I recommend the book, but let's do a tactical breakdown of how each of these characters responded to the test. I will of course leave a lot of the loaded details unspoiled so that there is still a reason to read the novel yourself which I recommend, as it does dig deep into their characters, and it's still valid for the Prime Universe canon today. Let's set up the scenario first. Each time it begins more or less the same way. The starship, in this case usually a Constitution class cruiser, patrols a neutral zone in the Gamma Hydra sector. There are neutral zones on the Federation borders with the Romulan Star Empire and the Klingon Empire in the 23rd century. In both cases, entering the neutral zone by either side is considered an act of war. After the starship plots a patrol course that avoids the neutral zone, a distress call is received, which is the following. Imperative! This is the Kobayashi Maru, 19 periods out of Altair 6. We have struck a gravitic mine and have lost all power. Our hull has penetrated and we have sustained many casualties. Of course, our bridge communications officer will respond with something like, This is the starship Yorktown. Your message is breaking up. Can you give your coordinates? Repeat, this is the starship. Yorktown, our position is Gamma Hydra Section 10. Of course, this puts the distressed ship well into the neutral zone. The message escalates. Hull penetrated. Life support systems failing. Can you assist us, Yorktown? Can you assist us? Data on Kobayashi Maru indicates that this is a civilian neutronic fuel carrier, which happens to carry 300 passengers. And a gravitic mine is an interesting concept. This would have to be a device that can yank a starship out of warp. Perhaps the shock of this would put fatal stress on the ship's hull. Such a device might generate its own gravity well when detecting a ship passing nearby at warp. So this initiates the first part of the test. Will the student immediately risk war by breaking the treaty and entering the neutral zone? Or will the student be more cautious, hesitate, and risk the immediate loss of about 380 souls. Most choose to initiate the rescue, and there is always someone within the bridge crew that reminds the captain that entering the neutral zone is an act of war. How the student responds to this is also part of the test. Of course, when the unfortunate starship arrives on the scene, the signal for the freighter is lost, and they are jumped by three Klingon battlecruisers, and the real test begins. So let's get into the lore. We're going to start with Chekhov, our favorite 23rd century Russian, as his response was the simplest. And here it is. As you can see when faced with a no-win scenario, Chekhov decides to take the enemy with him. The fallout from this choice was not easy for Chekhov as not only did he have a rather hard-nosed instructor, many of his classmates poked fun at him for his decision. Later, he and his classmates would undergo another command scenario, which went something like this. They're stranded on a space station, and there's a secret assassin that wants to kill them all. Their job was to simply stay alive, and they were all given phasers, hardwired to stun, and unleashed on the station. Naturally, they end up turning the station into their own sort of laser tag shooting arena, only there is a hard lesson in command that none of the cadets learned. I won't spoil the novel and let you know the outcome of this, but it certainly outlines just how badass Chekhov can be. And now for the opposite end of the spectrum, Sulu. Shortly after the distress call is received, Sulu spends some time attempting to figure out just what the hell is going on. 
He intensifies long-range sensor scans and finds nothing conclusive. He tries to interrogate the Kobayashi Maru to determine why it's in the neutral zone. And finally, he decides to do the unexpected. He tells the Kobayashi Maru that he is very sorry, but he cannot risk his ship and the possibility of interstellar war to initiate the rescue. The most difficult part of this for Sulu is rising above the bridge crew's protests, which border on insubordination. But Sulu sticks to his guns, maintains his cool command, and avoids the neutral zone. He would contact the nearest starbase, which would, in turn, go through the proper diplomatic channels and possibly arrange a joint rescue with the Klingons. Of course, by then, most of the survivors will likely have perished. Now, one of the things that Sulu was dealing with at the time was the death of his great-grandfather, who he was very close to. At that age, he had not dealt with death much, and the regret and shock of it made him rather cautious, as it was still fresh in his heart. But, of course, Sulu would later become a great captain and even command the Excelsior. It's possible that Starfleet Command wanted a more cautious commander to handle their most advanced asset at the time. Alright, now let's get to Kirk. And let's get real, Kirk is kind of a sore loser. But rather than blame everyone else, like a persistent rabid dog, he just comes back and tries again. After taking the test twice, he responds to the destruction of his simulated vessel with strong pent-up emotion. He has a heart-to-heart -heart with his instructor who explains that the Kobayashi Maru scenario will always inflict more damage, spawn more ships, and do whatever it needs to to defeat him. It cheats, Kirk would say. His teacher would try to explain to them that it is meant to prepare him for the real-world possibility of a no-win scenario. Unfortunately, nothing short of real-life experience would plagate the young Kirk. He felt since the program cheats, he can cheat too. He was no computer expert, but modifying the test would be a simple matter. It was the fallout from the school that was the risk. So here's how it went. After the initial barrage from the Klingons, the shields are pretty much useless. Kirk hails the Klingons and lets them know that he is Captain Kirk, commanding the USS Potemkin, on a peaceful rescue mission. And that he did not want to fight, but he would defend himself, and he would prove it if necessary. So the Klingon commander actually responds and says, The Captain Kirk? As if he were some legendary and feared captain. The Klingons quickly agree to assist with the rescue, and while this interaction is happening, the dead helmsman on the floor begins cracking up. Now, the problem, of course, is Kirk's unwillingness to accept defeat, which is often a beneficial quality, but it is also one that causes some hubris. Kirk would learn to become truly humble or wise until after facing many near-death situations in real life throughout his career. Of course, he would eventually mature. Now when it comes to Scotty, as he himself says, when it comes to destructive tendencies, these barons have nothing on me. Of course, Scotty decides to attempt the rescue of the freighter without hesitation. The initial clean on attack devastates Saratoga's shields, causes premature detonations in the torpedo tubes, and a power loss to the starboard nacelle. Scotty is shocked by this. Even three Klingon battlecruisers should not do that much damage with a single barrage. The DC bridge officer sort of shrugs and says, Klingon disruptors, sir. Scotty shakes it off and orders power to phasers. He orders each phaser bank to pick a target and then ramp up through phaser frequencies from low to high until they cut through the Klingon shields. The tactic works, and all three Klingon ships go up in a blaze. And then five more Klingon battlecruisers appear. Unfortunately, the same move cannot be done again as the phaser banks are now burnt out. Scotty orders all shield power to the front. He then orders engineering to send a canister of antimatter to the nearest transporter room. At the same time, he orders that the now useless torpedo bays have all their torpedoes moved to the transporter rooms. Scotty then has the antimatter canister beamed out into the path of the approaching Klingons, and then the canister beamed back 
without the antimatter. This serves as a kind of antimatter mine, and all five Klingon ships are destroyed. And then nine Klingon cruisers appear, pursuing the Saratoga out of the neutral zone. The next maneuver is the most interesting. Apparently the Klingons link their shields together to form one giant shield around a small task force. This way, if any one ship begins to take too much fire, the others can reinforce that ship with their own shield power. So what Scotty does next is he transports several torpedoes out to each juncture point between the Klingon shields and detonates them. This apparently has the effect of slipping through the Klingon shields, making it possible for the torpedo detonations to destroy the Klingons at least in theory and in the simulation, and we will come back to that. And then 15 ships appear to attack Scotty's ship. We can all guess the inevitable outcome here, but after the simulation, apparently Scotty is in some trouble. One of the admirals with some understanding of engineering explains to the primary instructor that Scotty used the Pereira field theory to destroy the Klingons, where a photon torpedo placed at the juncture between interlinking shields will nullify the shields due to stress. And while the theory should be flawless on paper, it is wrong. In real-world experiments, the Pereira shield theory does not work. This is one of those examples of real-life versus simulation. The computer saw the theory as mathematically valid, but when tested in the field, it fails. And to make things worse, a certain someone published the paper on the Pereira shield theory and the resulting experiments. Now I will not reveal who that certain someone was, you'll just have to read the book. Anyway, suffice it to say, it was decided that the command path was not for Scotty. So he was encouraged to take the engineering focused path in the academy. Aw, oh, poor Scotty. How terrible it is for him to not have to command a starship, but mostly just keep them working at peak performance. Now what is great about the Kobayashi Maru scenario which is just one name for the no-win scenarios that are kept secret, is that it forces young officers to think about their mortality. And many of the young, especially in a utopian society such as the Federation, are quite ignorant about the reality of death. Where it may be quite clinical in Federation society, death can be spontaneous and brutal out there among the stars. Well, thank you so much for watching, Space Friends. Tell me how you think you might have dealt with the no-win scenario. Tell me which of these characters dealt with it in the way that you liked best. Also, I really appreciate your efforts to help the channel to grow by commenting, giving this a like, and sharing wherever you can. And if you're into 3D modeling, both of these models used here are available on the CG Trader store that I will have linked in the description below.